Investigators with the NTSB are combing through a Tierra Santa neighborhood right now, trying to piece together what caused a deadly small jet crash. In the early morning hours just yesterday outside of San Diego, California, a Cessna 550 crashed onto Sample Street two miles short of its intended runway. Let's take a look at what happened. Station triple six Delta Sierra is descending through uh, one seven thousand for one two thousand. Station triple six Delta Sierra SoCal approach. The uh, Montgomery Gate Sox is out of service. Uh, what approach would you like? Okay, so let me pick it up from here. A couple of uh, bits of information have been given to us. It's a citation. The tail number is uh, 666 Delta Sierra, uh, and uh, they're just now calling in with approach control. SoCal is Southern California. And the ASOS, it says, is out of service. What is ASOS? It's the Automated um, Surface Observing System, and it's a collaboration between the National Weather Service, the FAA, and I think the Department of Defense, where uh, nationally, any place you go, you can get weather for a local airport. They're telling the pilot there is no weather being forecast for his destination. That's number one. Yeah, six up here. Yeah, we noticed that. Um, take the uh, RNAP 28, please. Six up is here. Clear direct NFC. Defend power discretion. Maintain nine or seven. Okay, so now they're out of 17,000 for 9,000. They've been cleared direct to Nesty. I'll show you the approach plate right here. Nesty uh, is, uh, I've got it circled in green for you. Uh, they're supposed to cross Nesty at 3,600 feet. And uh, right under the 3,600 that you can see there under Nesty, there's a hard line. That means it's a hard altitude. You can't go below that altitude. There are some other hard altitudes on this approach. We're going to talk about those in just a minute. Let's continue. Six Delta Sierra, direct Messi, descending for 900,000. Six Delta Sierra, I just wanted to know if you uh, really had any idea on the weather. Um, I got the Gillespie weather, but uh, as I'm sure you know, sometimes it can be dramatically different between Gillespie and Montgomery. Okay, so this pilot knows the area. He knows that between Gillespie, which is just a few miles away, and Montgomery, his intended landing point, the weather can be quite dramatically different. That would include altimeter settings as well. We'll talk about that in a minute. So just put a pin in the altimeter setting. But what it looks like is that fog is moving in. And I'll show you how to tell whether a fog bank is moving in, even if you don't have the weather at your destination. Okay, thanks. Yeah, according to the last view, it's pretty much down to minimum. So I just want to uh, see what I'm, what I'm in for here. Okay, no problem. So he's looked at the weather at, uh, at Gillespie, and it's pretty much down to minimums. That means it's really poor visibility, low ceiling. Uh, there's something that's called indefinite. It's uh, indicated by a VV in front of whatever they think the ceiling is. Uh, when I see VV in front of uh, 002, which would mean indefinite 200 overcast, means that they really can't tell what the overcast is. That indicates fog uh, to a pilot. There it is. There's your first uh, weather observation. And it says, now this is for Gillespie. This is the other airport. Here's a couple of things that you need to key in on. Number one, the wind in knots. It's zero, 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 zero. All those five zeros. Winds are completely calm. There's no weather. There's no wind whatsoever. That's the first indication of fog. Next is one half SM. That's a statute mile. You got a half a statute mile of visibility. And then it says FG, right? Now, this is the easiest indication. It's fog. That's what FG stands for. Overcast at 200. But the most important information for me on this is what is next. 14 slash 14. What does that mean? 14 is the temperature in Celsius. And the other 14 is the dew point. It's the moisture saturation of the air. If it is zero difference between 14 and 14, zero, that means it's fog and it might be dense fog. Number six up here. I've got the uh, Miramar automated weather. Uh, for 0955 Zulu uh, with uh, wind calm, there's only one half and indefinite ceiling 200. Six up there. All right. Uh, that doesn't sound great, but uh, we'll give it a go. Six up. Okay, so now you get a little bit of a 
insight to the mindset of this pilot. It doesn't sound great, but we'll give it a go. This is kind of a mission hacker mentality. Uh, we'll go down and take a look and see what it looks like. Should he have done that or not? I'll give you my thoughts here in a minute. Yeah, just in case we have to go. Man, how's the brown looking? Is that pretty similar? Uh, let me take a look. Thanks. So he's thinking about an alternate already. Fixed up here, affirmative, uh, a little bit better, but not much. They're showing uh, in standby. Okay. Okay, they're showing uh, 1031 Zulu weather. Went calm, visibly two and one half, missed, ceiling 300, broken, uh, cooking 300 overcast. Okay, so the big deal there is the visibility is two and a half miles, not a uh, half a mile. The half a mile visibility is super important, and I'll tell you why. Okay, six out there, a little better, but a uh, higher minimum, so uh, probably uh, not a great option either. So I'll, I'll come back to you with uh, an alternate just if you six out here, right? All right, now here's special weather for another airport nearby. Two and eight, that's the one we just looked at, two and a half miles visibility, 300 overcast, 15 and 14 are the temperature dew point spread, probably fog moving in. BR over there on the left-hand side means um, baby rain drizzle. It's, it's draining just a little bit. Yeah, fixed up this year, so Cal, you can make the scent okay from there. You want me to turn you out to the south? Uh, yeah, no, I think we'll be all right. He's a little high Six coming in. Here, Roger, five miles from Nesty, cross out or above 3,800, clear down Amber and White to the Red Brook. All right, out or above 3,800 uh, for uh, clear down Amber to a right approach. Montgomery. Okay, let me take you back to the approach plate now. The approach plate I showed you earlier. I uh, had Nesty circled on it, and it says 3,600 at Nesty. So now he's been cleared to Nesty. And I think he told him 3,800 or above. So he's given him like a 200-foot kind of buffer above Nesty. That, that's normal. The next point we need to look for is I circled it in red. It's Palos intersection. The ADS data now of his elevation or his, uh, his uh, flight path now shows that he was just a little bit below that 1,380 that's circled there and it's got a hard line under it so you can't go below 1380. I think the ADS uh, data says he was somewhere around 1200 feet so he's almost 200 feet below where he needs to be when he gets to Palos. Uh, what's going to happen next is there's a ridge, a bump, there's a ridge uh, like a hill between uh, Palos and the runway and on top of that hill are some high tension wires that are even another 50 to 100 feet above. Let me show you what that looks like. So let's say we got the aircraft coming in here. Here's the runway. He's been cleared for the approach. And here is this ridge that we're looking at right here. There are two ways for a pilot to come in on this. We can do the old dive and drive, which is go down and drive in. But look what happens if you do that. And sometimes when the visibility is poor and you're thinking to yourself, well, maybe I can get a peek at the runway. If I get down below that overcast, pilots are tempted to dive and drive in, but they're going to run right into that peak. The, the way the airplane wants them to fly is like this. It's an RNAV approach and it's going to build a glide slope for them so that they're well above this peak. I don't know that he, he dove down and then drove in. Uh, it's likely that he could have, or the other option is his altimeter setting was off. Remember, they don't have weather for the Montgomery airport. If his altimeter was significantly off, he could be much lower. So when he gets to Palos, which is basically right here, he was 200 feet low. Maybe he got even lower than that and just clipped that wire. Or it could have been a combination of both, dive and drive and a ballot altimeter setting. Hard to say. The final report is going to tell us that. Let's listen in. November 6th, Delta Sierra. Uh, report your FR cancellation after landing via the phone. Do you have the number? Six Delta Sierra. Yeah, I've got the number. So that tells me it's an uncontrolled airfield. There's no control tower that time in the morning. He gives him a phone number so that when he lands, he can close out his flight plan. That's something that has to get done after he lands. Hopefully not see you, but might we might have to. They start the approach. They get low. 
either the altimeter setting or dive and drive. Rocket break traffic citation, triple six Celtic Sierra, three miles, final two eight. All right, now, what is that call that he just made? Montgomery traffic, he switched to the, the common frequency that everybody would be listening to if they were coming into that airport. And he just makes a general call, says I'm on a three mile final and I'm on for, for runway 28 right. So he tells everybody where he is and then you're gonna hear seven clicks. Now, what is this click, 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 click thing? It's pilot controlled lighting. He can actually, on that same frequency, click his microphone without speaking and raise the, the light level on the runway. This guy doesn't see the runway yet. He gives it seven full clicks. That's a maximum. Uh, so that he's hoping, hoping to see something. Clicks it again. And the next thing is the aircraft crashes onto Sample Street. Everybody on board was killed. Miraculously, nobody on the ground was killed. Uh, he crashed into a, a street. I don't know if that was on purpose or not, but it saved all those people that were asleep in their homes. Next, I want to take a look at the ADSB data, and I want to show you this picture. Uh, this is from right to left as you're looking at your screen. That's his flight path. So he gets very low here, and in fact, there there's the power line right in the middle, uh, and he clips that power line. You're going to see the airplane pitch up sharply after he hits the power line. Why was that? Well, it's a couple of things. It could have been because he hit the power line, it snapped something off the airplane that caused it to pitch up. Most pilots are going to instinctively pull back because, oh, crap, I just hit something, right? He's going to he's gonna pull back. And at that point, the aircraft most likely stalled. It's very slow. Uh, there's not much power up on it. He pulls back on it, and the airplane then descends and crashes two miles short of the airport. We took a look at the approach plate earlier. I want to take a look now at another aspect of the approach plate, which is indicative of me of the errors that were made all the way along on this approach. First of all, he doesn't have the weather for the airport he's landing at. He's not sure of the altimeter setting. He's going to give it a go. He says, I'm going to go down and take a look, which is a bad idea. I don't think he was even authorized for this approach. The minimums on this approach uh, the, and take a look at the LNAV, VNAV minimums. I've got those underlined there. LPV minimums are a little bit lower. Most airplanes don't have the equipment for LPV. I'm assuming that he's got the LNAV, VNAV minimums. That's 750 feet. That gets him, basically the airport elevation is like 430. That gets him to about 320-ish feet above the ground altogether. But it, most importantly is what's in parentheses here. It says uh, parentheses 400-3 quarters. That's the visibility he needs to even shoot this approach. He's not legal for the approach with a half a mile of visibility. He got a half a mile from all the other surrounding airports. My assumption would be the airport I'm going to is, is the same or even worse. He doesn't have the visibility for it. And then on the next approach plate, and I've circled it, uh, this Cessna Citation 550 is a Category C aircraft. Now, all the, there's A, B, C, and D, right? And it has to do with the speed, your approach speed, not how big you are, but how fast you have to go to fly the approach before you can touch down. So some smaller airplanes have a higher approach category. This is a category C aircraft. And look at what it says under category C for that RNAV 28 right to Montgomery. N-A. He's not even authorized for this approach in the category airplane he's in. Those are all things that the pilot could have and should have caught before he even started the approach. The idea of going diving and driving or going down to take a look or let's give it a go is a really bad idea. An inexperienced pilot who's a mission hacker is going to make decisions like this and it ended up being fatal for everybody on board. Fortunately, nobody on the ground uh, was killed either. Um, that's what we know so far about this crash. That's my thoughts on what happened here. This approach should have never been made. He should have looked for some place with better weather. He had been flying all night. I think the flight started in Teterboro. It refueled in, in uh, Wichita and then another three and a half hours later in the fog in the, in the early morning, uh, they attempt this approach fatally so into Montgomery Airport and everybody passes away. It's very sad and very tragic and super avoidable. It should have never happened. 
Well, now you know. Uh, I'm Captain Steve. Fly safe.